Good morning, good morning. I'm pinch hitting for good Benny morning. Dang today. So, God is good. All the time. And all the time, God is good. good. Now, if you join me in our call to worship, let us walk in a manner that is worthy of God and the calling to which we have been called. Confessing, repenting, and surrendering ourselves to God. Let's be honest, acknowledging our sinfulness and brokenness, confessing, confessing repenting, and surrendering, surrendering ourselves to God. God. Let's remember that sin is first and foremostly against God. Confessing, confessing repenting, and surrendering ourselves to God. God. Like ripples in a pond, our sin then injures others and ourselves. Confessing, confessing repenting, repenting and surrendering ourselves to God. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Spirit, unleash your power of your love and grace as we learn to live honestly, humbly, and gratefully. Amen. Let's all stand together and sing at Calvary. May be seated. Good to see each of you with us on this Sunday. I was visiting about a week ago and they said this coming week's one of those dead weeks where a lot of people will go for a last uh, maybe vacation or weekend away. So we see a number of our folks aren't with us today and I pray that they will be blessed wherever they are, will be rested when they come back and safe on their travels. But it is a joy to see each of you with us. Some have just recently returned from their little uh, visit or uh, vacation. And uh, others are here faithfully, um, maybe working even through this summer period. So glad to see each of you with us. Our theme today is the power of confession. And if you would join me in our prayer in unison as we explore the dynamics and the gifts that come to us through confession. Most merciful God, we humbly admit that we need your help. 
We confess that we have wandered from your way, we have done wrong, and we have failed to do what is right. You alone can save us, have mercy on us, wipe out our sins, and teach us to forgive others. Create a clean heart in us, and renew a right spirit within us, in Christ, and for his glory alone. Amen. As our ushers come forward, we will receive tithes, offerings, and faith promise gifts this morning. Our stewardship reflection comes out of Psalm 112, verse 9. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn will be lifted high in honor. Lord, make us such people. What a fine group of ushers we have this morning. In the spirit of what we've just read, let us pray. Lord, we are not righteous in and of ourselves. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. But in you, we discover righteousness, the right way to think and live, a life that matters, that impacts. And so we pray this morning, fill us afresh with your spirit. Continue to instruct us through your word. Lord, we pray that our lives would be a blessing to you and to others. Bless the gift and the giver. Use what is given to touch lives with the gospel and the power of your spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. sing our doxology together. be seated. Thank you, David. Thank you, Cindy. We are blessed this morning to have our chancel choir with us under the capable direction of Sandy Cross, and they're going to be sharing with us a, uh, an anthem this morning, Puri Purify My Heart.
Thank you, Gayla. Thank you, Sandy. It is our last Sunday of the month, and we're going to be taking up a noisy offering for our mission partners. If a few of our children will come forward and get our noisy buckets. One more. Yes, Jesus loves. Woohoo! Woohoo! Load it up. Shake it a little there for me. Yeah, I hear it. Uh huh. Let's pray together. Lord, what a privilege it is to be able to give. Thank you for each coin that has been given, each dollar bill, each check. We want to be a blessing to our mission partners. I think of the evangelist there in India who's in hospital right now, Kranthi Stephen, who's very sick. And uh, thank you that we can help him in some small way as he's taken Bibles and shared the good news with tribes to the north that haven't heard and be with him in his sick bed, very sick, his lungs compromised with COVID. Be with our friends over there in Uganda as we help sick people get well, hungry people get fed, as we educate children, as we share the gospel through our mission partners. Bless the gift and the giver Help us to shine the Christ light for you. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Today our theme is confession. So remind me what confession is. Telling the truth. Even when you don't want to tell the truth. We have a couple of expressions. Coming clean. Letting the cat out of the bag. We've been hiding the cat in the bag, and now we've got to open the bag and let the cat come out, okay? The Bible has an expression, speaking the truth in love. So there's a, an adage, confession is good for the, for the soul or for the heart, okay? And especially, hear me today, confession is good for relationships, if you are hiding, if you are covering, acting like someone you're not, then that image, that imagination is false. And you can't have a relationship with something that doesn't exist. I mean, we can act like it exists, but it doesn't. Projecting that we're better than we are or different from who we are. 
when we confess, when we let the cat out of the bag, it's a bit scary, but it's true. It's who we are. And when you know who you are, and people know who you are, then you can really have a relationship. And that's especially true for God. You see, God knows who we are, but if we're acting like we're something else, then we build this big distance between ourselves and God. And you can't have fellowship with somebody who's false. It's not real. It's not authentic. It doesn't really work. It's a lie. In fact, it's empty. It's just hard to make the connections. Now, when we are honest, when we let the cat out of the bag, then all of a sudden the relationship has a chance to really connect and grow. And if it's been injured, to heal. And if we've been in a bad place, with God's help, we can get better. So he has a new adage. Confession helps you and me get better. If we do not confess, if we act like we're better than we are or we're hiding, we stay sick. You and I are condemned to be sick and broken and distant until we confess. It's a wonderful gift of God. It's not easy, it's painful. But somebody has wisely said, when you confess, it's like a surgeon who's got a scalpel and he goes and he cuts whatever is injured or infected or if it's a cancer, he cuts and he removes it. And then he can stitch it together and it can heal. But if you don't confess, it's like that cancer is left and it grows and it festers. And guess what? It kills us. Unconfessed sin, injured relationships that never come clean, never get close again, fester and finally die. And God doesn't want that for us. God wants us to live. And not just any old way, a good life, an abundant life. So is confession a good idea? Yes. It's tough to have to say, I was wrong. Somebody has said it takes a man or a woman to say, I was wrong. Okay, I sinned. I messed up. I'm not all you think I am. I messed up. But that's me. And here's the beauty of the grace of God. He wants to have a relationship with the real you and the real me. Good, bad, and ugly. He knows He's not, you said what? You did, you did what? He knows. But he wants you to come clean and he wants me to come clean and be honest so that we can have a real relationship. And there he can heal. And there he can restore. And there he can grow. It's big. Confession is big. Because it helps you become you, the real you. And it helps people know the real you and make a real relationship possible without that we're just kidding ourselves we're on the run lord thank you for confession not easy Ooh, sometimes lord those words they come out and ooh, they kind of stick in our throat we kind of cough <coughs> when we've got to admit i messed up i lied i sinned i cheated whatever it was but we know that when we do, your blood is powerful enough to forgive and your grace is great enough to cover and heal and restore. So help us to get comfortable with being honest, with being transparent, with confessing so that we can restore ourselves, our souls, so that we can restore our relationships and best of all, so that we can truly be close and connected to you. You, our beloved Heavenly Father. It's in the name of Jesus we pray and everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
Please join me this morning in our prayer for illumination as we ask God to take the scriptures and make them come alive to us so that we can understand them and live them. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy and obey with gladness what you say to us today. Amen. Two Small scriptures, one from 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Remember, there's a gospel of John, one of the gospels told by John or the community he was a part of. And then there are three letters or epistles, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. This is from 1 John, the first epistle. And then the second from James, one of the uh, epistles that we have in our New Testament, James chapter 5 and verse 16. 1 John 1 verse 9, you should know this one, maybe have memorized it. If we confess our sins, he, that is God, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And then from James chapter 5 and verse 16, confess your sins to each other. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I think what James is saying is it gets it done. When we confess and we trust each other and we pray for each other, it works. It gets the job done. And I want to add two scriptures to these. Psalm 51 is maybe the most powerful of the prayers prayed, confessing sin, owning exactly who we are and what has happened. It's one of the many psalms written by David, prayed by David, and of course there are many tunes that have been set to these various psalms. So they are sung, they are prayed, and they are testimonies. Listen to what David says in this psalm. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. What an incredible prayer David has prayed in Psalm 51. And then Proverbs 28 verse 13 says the following. He who hides his sins will not prosper. This is a spiritual truth, a spiritual reality. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Proverbs 28 verse 13. The power of confession, why is it so difficult? Why do we struggle with 
confession. And I guess there's fear or doubt or insecurity that each of us struggles with. That if I really tell people who I am or what I've done, they will no longer love me or no longer want to be my friend, will no longer support me. And maybe on the deepest part, they will think less of me. And it's interesting that our scriptures tell us that each of us must not think more highly of ourselves. That pride is projecting an image that makes others think we're more than we are, better than we are. And we're afraid that if we tell people who we really are, they'll see us for less than what they perceived us to be. And of course, the scriptures say this, that when we are prideful in that way, God will resist us. That that kind of proud spirit that we all suffer from will cause God to have to resist us. That the very remedy that we need, the, the medicine for what we are dealing with is available from God, but a proud or a haughty spirit will cause God to resist us. But if we humble ourselves, and this is what humble yourself means, if you will be transparent, if you'll be who you really are, if you'll be courageous enough to say, at my best, I may be this, but at my worst, I'm like this. You know, sometimes people do things wrong or say things they shouldn't say, and they'll say, oh, that wasn't me. No. No, that was you. Okay. Sometimes they commit some terrible sin and they say, I don't know what happened to me. No, you know what happened to you. That is you and that is me. We often want to excuse or act like that is somehow different from who I am, but it is not. The good, the bad, and the ugly are who we are. And the beauty of grace is that God sees you for who you are and loves you for who you are, calls you to himself just as you are, but he won't leave you that way. When you and I confess and come clean, then he can deal with our sin, our brokenness, the sickness that each of us suffers from. Listen, folks, that sickness infects us from birth. The fallenness, the brokenness of our being is inherent. It's in us. It didn't just happen somewhere along the way. It wasn't just a bad day. It's there. And when the circumstances are right, it comes out. Those words, those thoughts, those actions. And we can see it all the way through our biblical narrative from the very first humans who sin against God. Isn't it interesting that after Adam and Eve sin, they run and hide? We still do that. They try to cover up. They try to somehow make God think they're okay or they're better than they are, that they're not in the mess they are. And I'm so glad that God doesn't just say, that's it, I'm done. He comes and calls and he comes looking and he tries to restore the relationship. Our God is a restorer. Our God's love is big enough for all your sins and all your mistakes. Hear me today. You can't do anything that can make God love you less than he loves you. Because his love is not based or dependent upon your performance. If your performance is what makes God love you, then all of us are in a lot of trouble. Because I don't think God would feel very loving toward us if it was dependent on your performance, on your track record. But God's love for you is dependent on himself, on his being. So at your worst, God's love stays strong. It isn't diminished. Now, does that mean that God is not affected by your sin? No, he is. He is saddened by your sin and mine. He's disappointed. He's heartbroken. He weeps. Like any parent who had high hopes for the kids when they live far below their potential far below what they were capable of 
It breaks the heart of a parent. And our God is a great parent, far beyond anything we've seen. If we know how to do good, if we know how to have high hopes, if we know how to ache inside when things are horribly wrong, just imagine what the heart of God feels like. So he loves us no matter what. That's why Paul can write, Peyton, where sin abounds, and it does, grace much more abounds. I don't care how high the mountain of sin is, the grace of God is higher still. I don't care how bad it gets, the goodness of God exceeds the bad. And he calls us to himself. And in order to respond, we've got to be like Adam and Eve, where we finally say, here I am. Why are you hiding well? We suddenly realized we're naked and things are not good. Oh, you're naked. Tell me about it. God is good that way. He will go right to the problem and say, let's talk about it. And you might say, I don't want to talk about it. How many people have you been around who say, I don't want to talk about it? Or maybe it's you. You have said, I don't want to talk about it. Because it's still too painful, too raw, too embarrassing. God is brave enough to go right there and say, well, let's talk about it. What have you done? And then he has the means, the love, the ability to deal with the problem. Most of us are inclined to run away from God. And God is hoping that we'll run to him. That we'll come and ask him for help. That we'll tell him what has happened. Like when we were little and we hurt ourselves and we went running to mom with our boo-boos. And mom scoops us up in her arms and mom makes the boo-boos better. That's exactly how it is, folk. That's what confession is. Knowing that you have a God who loves you and he's capable of helping you. And he's waiting for you. Please, don't run away from God. Please run right into the loving arms of God. Tell him what's going on. You might say, well, he knows. Yeah, he knows. But he wants you to tell him. He wants you to speak to him. He, the relationship cannot heal unless you and I share what's going on in our lives with him. In fact, when we sin, it brings separation. It brings distance. And the longer you allow that distance to grow, the further away you feel from God. Not because he left you, but because you have moved away, and I've moved away. And that hurt, that injury, that sin starts to fester. Like a cancer, it grows within us. And God is saying, how long are you going to run in the wrong direction? How long am I going to have to wait here for you to turn around and come back like the prodigal? Finally, when are you going to come to your senses? When are you going to come back and say, I made a mess of things? And God says, I'm glad you were brave enough to tell me. And let's see what we're going to do to take it and sort it out. He forgives us our sins if we confess them. And He's merciful and graceful enough to restore us and help us to live the right way. To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All that was wrong, all that was broken, all that is messed up, God's going to help us. Now, like our call to worship, when you and I sin, it's like a pebble in a pond. It's firstly and foremostly against God. It impacts Him most of all. Every relationship that we injure, God is attached to. Your family, your friends, your community, your nation. God is connected to all of that. It impacts him most of all. But it affects others and it affects you. The Bible says you can't take fire to your breast and not burn yourself. David is a good example. How I love David. What a fine young boy he is. Responsible, hardworking. David the shepherd boy. The sheep are in good hands. David the young man of faith who knows what God is capable of and faces Goliath and, and kills him and cuts off his head. David who's a musician, who's a prayer warrior. David who could soothe a troubled king. David who'd have to flee for his life when the whole kingdom was after him. David who would get desperate and pour his heart out to God. David who would finally become king of Israel, a shepherd boy 
who becomes a king. David, who at his worst saw a pretty woman and said, Ooh, I've got to have her. And schemed and planned and made it happen. Had an adulterous affair. And then decided, I better run from God. I better cover it up. I don't want to talk about it. I don't know how many times God might have tapped him on the shoulder and said, David, we've got to talk. And I'm sure he said, not now, Lord. I'm real busy. I'm running the empire right here. I don't want to talk about it. Until finally God sends him Nathan. Tells him that story. And David gets so mad at this mean neighbor who killed this beloved little lamb. And Nathan says, you are that one. You are that man. And all of a sudden, all of that sin and brokenness, all of that hiding, covering, all comes home to roost. And he writes that beautiful prayer, that heartbroken prayer that we just read. And he unleashes all kinds of poison into his family, into the kingdom. But once he comes to God and asks for forgiveness, God forgives. And then God says, I'm going to have to help you through all of the mess you've created. Listen, folks, you can't sweep it under the carpet. It doesn't go away. All that stuff has got to be dealt with. But here's the beauty. When we confess, God not only forgives and restores us, but he says, I will be with you. And I will clean up the mess. I will struggle right alongside of you. If you read David's life at the end, it's heartbreaking. But listen to me. Don't miss out on what the remedy is. Speak the truth in love. Tell God who you are. He knows who you are. Tell him, Lord, when I'm at my best, man, I'm so proud. I'm doing well. But when I'm at my worst, man, I can lie and cheat and deceive with the best of them. The heart of men and women is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. And if we let that sinful nature rise, can we have affairs? Yes. Can we tell lies? Yes. Can we steal? Yes. We can let all of those dark things fire up inside of us that break the heart of God, that injure others and injure us. And I'm so glad God doesn't look at you on your bad days and say, I don't like what I see. You're out of here. You're fired. God says, you're fired. No. God says, what's taking so long? Come. You need to come clean. You need to fess up. And if you do, the blood of Jesus is enough to forgive you. The blood of Jesus is enough to heal you. Is this powerful? It is, folk. This is the difference between life and death. No wonder he writes in Proverbs, if you hide your sin, you will not prosper. You'll be like somebody who's got a cancer and act like there's no problem until the cancer becomes life-threatening and kills you. But if you go and take care of it, who knows? Your life may be extended on earth and we know eternally you'll be with God. He promises that you'll be a new creation I want to close with the second part. James writes and says, you need to confess your sins to one another, your faults to one another. I hope you don't live so independently that you don't have anybody that you can really trust, that you can really be yourself with. I hope you have one or two or three people that you can speak out of your heart to and they can speak out of theirs to you, that you can be transparent, that they can really know you the you, the full you. Because this is what James says, that when you confess your sins to one another, then we can pray for one another and we will be healed. As long as you're hiding, as long as you're covering, as long as you're projecting who you're not, there's a sickness within you and me that can't be healed. But when we let that out, when we confess it, when we expose it, then it can be healed. Somebody has wisely said this, you and I are sick as our secrets, the things we hide. And I'm not talking about having some private life, that's fine. But let's not allow cancers to grow in us and we feel so independent, so isolated, so afraid that we can't tell others 
people that know us and love us and who can help us, who can pray for us. I hope that you're quick to say, listen, I need prayer. I'm struggling. God's got the remedy, but you and I have got to want it. I hope you be smart and go straight to the physician and say, Doc Kelly, I'm sick. I need some help. Have you got a prescription for me? Yes, come. I can help you. Spiritually, that's what's going on, folks. We are there to help each other, to pray for each other, to make sure we get healed. Please don't keep being sick, acting like everything's okay and it's not. We are there to watch over one another in love, pray for one another, encourage each other. And it doesn't happen unless you and I are transparent and honest and can trust each other enough to say, hey, David, I'm struggling. Would you pray for me? This is what's going on. Don't hide. Don't isolate. Don't act like there's more to you than there is. We are who we are. And that's where the real relationship takes place. That's where the distance is bridged by God and you connect and you become a beloved son and a beloved daughter. God waits. When you and I come to our senses and we can say truthfully who we are, God says, yeah, I know. I'm glad you finally admit it. Come, let me help you. And then things get better. God is committed to you and me getting better, not staying sick and trapped. Let's pray. Creating us a clean heart, Lord. Restoring us a right spirit. Blood of Jesus, wash over us and remove our sins as far as the east is from the west. Spirit of God, come and live within us. Give us the courage to be honest, to be transparent, to walk in the light as you are in the light. We need your help desperately each and every day. And we ask for it today in Jesus' name. Amen. We will remain seated and sing, I will serve thee. That's our testimony, every one of us. Thank God that he loves us in spite of ourselves. Just who we are, warts and all. Hallelujah. What a God. We're going to pray together for the needs of others. You're always welcome to come and kneel here at the altar if you feel so inclined. Heartaches and broken pieces and ruined lives and sin higher than the mountains. <laughs> but your touch makes all the difference. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, beloved Heavenly Father. Thank you, sweet Spirit of God. Please convict us as we confess. Please forgive us. Restore us. Restore our souls bind up our broken hearts heal our relationships make us sons and daughters that you'll be proud of 
each and every day. Give us the courage to speak the truth in love, to be honest. Lord, we've had three funerals, four actually. I didn't get to attend the fourth. Charity Hitch on Wednesday, we wrap Charity's family and friends up in our love and prayers. Be their comfort and strength. Be especially with Chris and Henry and Lily and Stella. We ask for your grace and your favor in their lives. And then we pray for the Craig family and the Hamilton family and the Reeves family. <coughs> all who have lost loved ones, all who are grieving, please be their comfort and strength. Lord, we celebrate Cynthia Shem's recovery to date and that she's feeling a lot better. She helped with the funeral dinner on, on Saturday, taking lead. Bless Cynthia and Rod Shem. We wrap them up in love and praise. Be with Robin Henshi as she fights cancer, life-threatening cancer, a second bout. Be with Brindley as she's waiting results from her tests at MD Anderson. We hope that the cancer's gone and that she's back in good health, 20 years old, fighting for her life. Be with Randy Bursagi as he fights the cancer in his body. Rowan Lowe as he fights the cancer in his body. Be with those who are dealing with Lou Garrick's or Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. We pray for Danny Moore's mom who's in the nursing home in Ugerton. We wrap her up this morning in our love and prayers. Be with Mark Freeman. Give him many good days. Bless him and Vicky. We love them. Lord, I pray for our MSC as we have to raise another $92,500 to discontinue and we've got to replace some of the carpet and repair some of the damage from the flood. We've got to fund that ministry. We want it to be strong. We want our students to be born again, to grow into deeply devoted disciples. Bless Ramey, bless Mackenzie, bless all of those interns that work with them, bless the families that support them. Bless Jeremy and OJ and all of those that support our youth here at Victory Memorial. Next week is VBS celebration, Lord. We pray that all the families and kids will come, that, yeah, they will experience your love and your goodness, that this will be a stake in the ground for all of them, Lord. May your presence be keenly felt by all of us. Make us a winsome part of your family. Make us a loving part of your family. Make us a generous part of your family. A blessing center right here at Victory Memorial. We thank you for the rains. Bless our farmers and ranchers. We thank you, Lord, for good jobs where we can pay bills, our homes, the food we eat, the clothes we wear. Wow, you've taken good care of us and we are grateful. Help us to serve you well as we pray the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You're in for a blessing. We have a, a beautiful YouTube music video this morning by Francesca Ballastelli. If we're honest, and if you know the words, sing along. If you don't, the words are in your bulletin. You can follow along. It's a real testament to the power of confession. Let's enjoy it together. I remind us, I remind myself that if we hide or cover, we will not prosper. But if we confess and if we forsake, God not only forgives, but he pours his mercy and grace upon us and we can thrive. Listen to me, God wants you to thrive. I have come that you might have life and life 
abundantly. May we learn the secret of running to God, not away from God. Let's walk in the light, humble, transparent, and vulnerable, imitating Jesus, who is the light, so we can enjoy fellowship with one another and be purified by the blood of Jesus. Amen.